Council of General Instructor Chairman Thorson coming to you from Room 167 to talk to you today about foreign policy and the Great War. So let's get started. First, we're going to talk about Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy, which, as you guys know, we've talked about this. One of his most famous quotes was, speak softly and carry a big stick. It will take you far. That big stick, meaning his U.S. Navy. He wanted to use the civilized American government to go and help out those uncivilized countries. And by helping it out, he basically wanted to um, extort their different resources and raw materials from those places. He felt by going to those countries, it would help these uncivilized nations. What did he consider uncivilized? Basically, anyone of a different race or of a different economic status, basically like a third world country. He also wanted to keep the open door policy going in Asia. Now, he did this by the agreement to end the Russo-Japanese War, which he ended in New Hampshire in 1906, and he made a deal backdoor with Japan to make trade agreements still okay with them. But Japan was starting to get naval dominance in the Pacific and pushing away the Americans, so Roosevelt answered with his big stick, meaning with his white, Great White Fleet or the U.S. Navy by creating the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. This basically said that European nations still could not intervene in the Western Hemisphere, just like the original Monroe Doctrine said, except he put a little twist on it, said the Americans had the right to intervene in Latin America and help out those countries. And that just gave him even more justification to impose the Platt Amendment that was put on Cuba in 1902. The last bit of foreign policy that Roosevelt had a lot of hold over was with the building of the Panama Canal. Now, the French had actually started building the canal with the Colombians, and when we tried to get um, access to continuing the building of it since the French had stopped, the leader of Colombia told our Secretary of State, John Hay, no, that's not going to happen. So Roosevelt stepped in and said, fine, we'll just talk the Panamanians into having a revolution so they can become their own country. Once they did that and Panama did become its own country, they granted us a six-mile strip of land to make the Panama Canal on which we will make, we make an agreement with them to control for 99 years, which, of course, as we learned about before, Jimmy Carter stops that deal and gives it back to the Panamanians. When Taft becomes president, he imposes his idea of dollar diplomacy. It's just like what we see with TR. He just wants to use investments and be involved involved in Latin America so that we can have a better trade relationship with them. Latin America, just like his predecessors did, but he came up with this idea. It was a little bit different called moral diplomacy, where he was going to work with countries that he felt were morally acceptable. And that's where he ran into a problem with Mexico. Um, at first, we see a lot of different, the revolution of Mexico happening in 1910, and then we see a lot of different leaders trying to take over Mexico. Now, the business leaders supported General Huerta, who uh, Wilson did not. He actually supported his opposition, um, who was Carranza. But later, eventually, Pacho Villa just takes over, and he was able to um, take over Mexico after that. But Wilson's idea was, I will support countries that have the same morals of the United States, but it kind of blew up in his face when the business owners in America who were investing in Mexico didn't support Wilson. Now we're going to look and move on to the Great War. What we're looking at in Europe right now is an alliance system. We're seeing that these nationalist, imperialist countries are joining together to help each other out in case someone attacks the other one. We see the Triple Entente, which has Great Britain, France, and Russia at the beginning. And then we see the Triple Alliance, which has Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. You can remember that the Alliance has Austria, so that's where you can remember the difference. But in June of 1914, June 28, 1914, the um, Serbian nationalists kill Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who is the leader of Austria-Hungary, and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire decides to invade Serbia. Well, Serbia calls up the Russians saying, please help us. The Rus Russians say, sure. And then this alliance system goes into place and everybody starts joining the war. Once the war started, Wilson decided to declare neutrality. He did not want to take either side. This wasn't our war. That didn't mean Americans didn't choose sides. A lot of the Irish immigrants and the Germans mostly sided with the Central Powers, but majority of Americans sided with the Allies. We did have strong ties with Great Britain. We did help them out and sell them and trade with them more than, and then eventually stop trading with the Germans. The Germans started getting a little upset by this, so they started uh, sinking not only British 
British ships, but also American ships, um, like the Lusitania 1915, which had Americans on it, and then the Sussex, which also had some Americans on it, were sunk by the Europe or the German U-boats. So Wilson called up Germany and said, listen, you got to respect neutrality. So the Germans were like, okay, okay, we'll back off. We're not going to attack any more merchant ships. And that's what they said at the time, but we all know that's not going to be true. Trying to see, as the war moved on in Europe, we're starting to see that Americans are fighting whether with each other whether or not they should get involved. Now Wilson stayed out of it because it was re-election time and he wanted to make sure he got re-elected. But there were still people who were the pacifists who didn't want to fight, but there were the interventionists who said we should get involved. Behind the scenes, though, our military was was getting ready. We were starting to build our um, military arsenal and get everything ready just in case we are going to get involved in the war, which we do. Now, when it came to the election of 1916, Wilson barely won the election and the Democrats barely won with him, but he still was able to win, so we will see him continue to be president during this war. Now that Wilson has won re-election, he's basically trying to get the country to side with him to get into this war. In January of 1917, we start seeing the Germans use unrestricted submarine warfare, meaning they're breaking the laws of neutrality. And then in February of 1917, the British intercept the Zimmerman telegram that basically has the Germans trying to persuade the Mexicans to join the war and get back the Southwest that was stolen from them from the Mexican War in the 1840s. With that and the Russian Revolution, now you need to understand this, the Russian Revolution in March of 1917 put in a Republican government. We're not going to see the Bolshevik Revolution where we have communism until November of that year. So we think that we're spreading democracy. Will we see that in Russia? We're mad at the Germans for doing this to us. Now we're deciding to go into war. So the next month, April 1917, the U.S. declares war on Germany and we enter World War I. Once the Americans entered the war, it took some pressure off of the British Navy from fighting the German U-boats. They were able to use our Navy as well to kind of take the pressure off so the German U-boats backed off a little bit. But something happened that hurt the United States and the Allies in November of 1917 was that Bolshevik Revolution where the Communists took over and they immediately left the war. They made the brest Livox Treaty with the Germans that said, we're done. So now the Germans, instead of fighting the Schlieffen Plan, which was the two-front war they had been fighting in the East and the West, now they could put all their resources in the West. And then the United States realized we didn't have enough troops to just support this new situation. So that's when we see the passage of the Selective Service Act, which was an official legalized draft from that point on. It was just for ages 21 to 30 at the time. It's now extended to ages 18 to 45. The American Expeditionary Force that was sent over to Europe to fight the in the Great War was very diverse. They had women fighting, uh, not fighting, they were non-combat roles, but they were helping with the fighting. And the African-American soldiers that fought over there were actually in segregated groups. Now, some of them were upset about being segregated. W.E.B. Du Bois even tried to fight it, but it didn't go anywhere. So some of them even joined the French armies because they didn't segregate uh, black and white. Even though the AEF did join the war in April of 1917, we didn't really see major fighting from them until spring of 1918. One, and the leader of the AEF was General John Pershing. He was like the Eisenhower of World War I. Once the U.S. got involved, they tipped the, the scales of stalemate to actually making offensive advances against the Germans because of trench warfare. People weren't moving. So they started actually helping the Allies move towards Germany. They won a major battle at the Battle of Chateau Thierry, uh, Terry, excuse me. And then in September, they fought a battle in the Argonne Forest, which helped, again, push back the Germans and tip the scale in the favor of the Allies. By uh, November 11th of 1918, the Germans uh, surrendered. They, they called for an armistice, which is also known as a ceasefire. The new technology of this war was something that any war hasn't seen beforehand. We see the rise of new weapons like uh, mustard gas, machine guns, trench warfare. We even see the rise of planes. Most of them were used for surveillance and fighting. But we also see the submarines and the dreadnought battleship, which I have uh, in the top left-hand corner. The casualties were absolutely extreme. We see in the millions for both the British and the Germans, and people just couldn't even fathom that numbers could be that large. 
So what exactly was going on at home during this time period? We had to totally revamp our economy to basically prepare for the war. Now, we put aside about $32 billion for the war, and we raised most of the money with either raising taxes or by selling what they called liberty bonds. It was just a propaganda uh, stint by the government to help people you know, want to get involved in the war effort. Wilson also created the Council for National Defense at the national level to take care of the centralization of the power, dividing the economy into different sections, not geographically, but based on function. Uh, but at the local level, the Civilian Advisory Commission was the one that basically mobilized people to get involved locally. The big one that controlled most of what was going on in the economy was known as the War Industries Board. They're the ones that purchased the military supplies. They're the ones that set prices that told the factories what to make and how to distribute the materials needed. Um, it sounds more like a communist type of regime, but in reality they were working to uh, help the private sector actually gain business contracts with the government. Like during most periods of war, the economy was actually booming at the time because there was so much demand, especially from the Europeans at first from the United States, and then there was just need for the U.S. to have different military supplies. So in industry expanded, and there were more opportunities for women and minorities to get jobs since all the men were at war. We also see during this time period, during the 1910s up until 1920, a period known as the Great Migration, where we see thousands of African Americans from the South and from rural areas moving up to the cities in the north where there were job opportunities and more freedom for them. So we start seeing growing black communities uh, in urban areas like New York, Detroit, Chicago, etc. Uh, women also were getting paid more at the time where they weren't being able to get these jobs during uh, peace times. Also, um, speaking of jobs and payments and everything, the National War Labor Board created um, better working conditions and pay, but the reason they did that it, in return, they uh, um, basically said that striking was illegal. Now, there, were, uh, there was one strike um, that did happen that ended up killing a bunch of miners, but it was because of the fact that strikes were considered illegal at the time. Just like with any war, we're going to see movements where people were against the war. So this section, we're looking for social unity because Wilson knew he was going to have to deal with people who were against the war. Um, people were divided over fighting in the war. Those who wanted peace were like German-Americans, Irish who supported uh, Great Britain, religious people, intellectuals, and then those on the left. Um, and the ones that got targeted the most were the communists at the time. Uh, even women during this time period were pushing for pacifism to, again, peace and ending the war. Wilson, even though the majority of the Americans were for the war, still had to face opposition. And he realized that, in his mind, the only way that we're going to have success in this war is to make sure that everyone was united behind the idea of the war. So he created something called the Committee of Public Information. It was headed by George Creel, and basically it distributed propaganda to Americans to make the Germans look bad and make their war effort look like it was a good thing. They also passed a few acts in Congress known as the Espionage Act of 1917, which basically said you would be punished if you were a spy for the Germans or the Central Powers. They basically targeted more of the socialists and the immigrants during this time with that act. They also passed the Sedition Act. Now, seditious speech, we learned about this with the Alien and Sedition Act, is where you speak badly against the government. They made that illegal. And they actually had almost these things called vigilante mobs who would spy on their neighbors to make sure they weren't speaking poorly against the government or spying on others. Kind of similar to how we learned about that with um, the Second Red Scare in the 1950s. Like I said, the targets were mostly socialists and immigrants. Um, people felt that you needed to be a loyalist, 100% Americanism, or you would face discrimination. And the group that faced it the most was actually German Americans, which was a very large population of America at the time. Okay, so like we've been, like I already said a while ago, the war is over. So now we're looking at a way to have new world order. So Wilson came up with this idea known as the 14 points. He actually created it long before the war had even ended. And it basically addressed three different areas, self-determination and boundaries, meaning uh, sovereignty and the boundaries of new countries, new international laws that included things with like free trade, colonial governments, no secret treaties, and then the third being the League of Nations, which he that was his infamous plan 
to have peace throughout the world. Now, he also was doing it as a way to combat the Bolshevik beliefs because they were afraid of communism becoming an idea in this post-World War. So we wanted to make sure that it established these points in the 14 points that communism really wasn't going to be accepted. Wilson thought that he had support for this plan, but he really didn't have support anywhere, not in Europe nor in the United States. Uh, the Allies were so decimated by the war and so resentful of what the Germans and the Central Powers did to them that they just wanted revenge, including uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, David Lloyd George, and then the French Premier, George Clemenceau. They just wanted revenge. And at home in 1918 in the midterm elections, the Democrats lost control of the House, which was what the party Wilson's in. So the newly formed Republican government in the House wasn't supporting his 14 points out. The Paris Peace Conference was where they decided what to do and how to end the war. And it was led by the Big Four, which were the leaders of the United States, France, Great Britain, and Italy. Now, Wilson had this ideal of how making this perfect, peaceful world would be, but there were too many people that just rejected it because they were worried about their own selves and worrying about what their countries would get out of this. And they also completely ignored what was going on with the Bolsheviks. They just decided to leave them out of it. Um, they also decided to not even recognize them as a true nation until the 1930s. Now, Wilson wanted to reject the reparations that the Britain, uh, the Britons and the French wanted of the Central Powers, but eventually had to agree to them if he wanted them to support his ideas. Um, they also created the League of Nations at this time. The Allies accepted it, um, even though that they would also agree to all these reparations. And they created this new system with different countries, so they completely carved out Europe and made it into a bunch of different countries that a lot of people weren't happy about because they were combining different cultures that did not get along into one country, for instance, like with Yugoslavia and with Czechoslovakia. Once the Treaty of Versailles was created at the Paris Peace Conference, Wilson had to bring it home to try to get it ratified by the U.S. Senate. But the U.S. Senate had no interest in ratifying this at all. It had, it, he came home to a lot of opposition. Uh, the leaders of this opposition in the U.S. Senate were nicknamed the Republican Irreconcilables because they wanted isolation. But it was also, they were led by Senator Henry Cabot Lodge because he just hated Wilson so he wanted to do anything he could to bury him. Wilson tried to travel the country to gain public support because he, like TR, realized if you use that bully pulpit, try to get the public behind you, that you could probably get the Senate on your side. Well, it exhausted him to the point where he had a stroke that made him incapable for weeks. And with this, the Senate took it to its advantage and made some ratifications to the um, adjustments to the Treaty of Versailles, and when it was attempted to get passed, Wilson told the Democrats, don't do it, I don't like these new um, changes that were made to the treaty, so it was never ratified or passed by the United States. So the man who made the League of Nations for the United States to join, the United States never did. I hope you're sitting down for the shocking news I'm about to tell you. When the war ended, there was a depression. We've never seen that happen before because all of a sudden the war contracts started just being canceled and people didn't need all the materials that were needed during the war, so people were also losing jobs. So this bubble burst, the GDP decreased, inflation and unemployment skyrocketed. Now this happened in 1920. In 1919, a year beforehand, we see the war had ended, so all of these businesses that were forced to um, give good working conditions and good pay and good uh, working hours tried to rescind them, and a lot of the workers started getting mad. And now that strikes were legal again, we see many strikes around the country. The two most famous ones at the time were the Boston police strike and the steel workers strike, and both failed. We're not going to see strikers actually get what they want until the 1930s. After the war, when the society is in turmoil, we're also seeing tensions between races. Uh, African Americans, when they came back from the war, they wanted to get some type of reward for their service in the war. And the ones that were home, working in the factories, wanted to be able to keep their jobs. Well, racial, racial tensions just started to rise because the white soldiers came back and wanted their jobs back. So a lot of black workers were fired from their jobs. And it uh, led to race riots in 
many different um, cities in the country, but the biggest one at the time being that in Chicago in 1919. One of the um, leaders of the civil rights movement during this time was Marcus Garvey. You can kind of equate him to like a Malcolm X style of leader. He was a black nationalist, just like Malcolm X. And he wanted and advocated um, embracing the African heritage and even encouraged many people for moving back to Africa, kind of like the idea of the American Colonization Society, the ACS, we saw in the 1820s. And he ejected assimilating to white culture. He wanted this, not this. This time period, too, is also the time where we see the first Red Scare. This is like the little R Red Scare versus the big R Red Scare of the 1950s. Why do we see this? Because we saw what happened with the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and we're seeing anarchists and communists and socialists in the United States. So then people start freaking out and wanting to go after them. Now, there were some actual attacks in the United States. Soviets were trying to spread revolution including in the United States, but we did see some uh, bombings in the United States by anarchists and some communists. So it freaked out the middle class and they wanted stability and they, and they looked to the government to get it. So there's a growing movement to fight this radicalism and embrace 100% Americanism, and this was known as the Red Scare. So these anti-radicals who wanted the stability um, pushed the government to do so, and we see that Attorney General Mitchell Palmer at the time conducted nationwide raids of different homes and different areas that um, suspected anarchists and communists were at. These raids were known as the Palmer Raids. Um, one other point to note out was in the 1920s, there were two Italian immigrants who were anarchists known as Sacco and Vanzetti who were put on trial because they were accused of murdering two men at a shoe factory. There really was no evidence to prove that they were involved in the murder, but people were so freaked out by anarchists and communists that they were used as scapegoats and were found guilty and executed in 1927. Now later down, during, down the road, it was found that they were actually not guilty of the crime. No more progressivism anymore. We're seeing a return to normalcy. That's what the Americans want. They want conservatism. They want isolationism. They want nationalism. And we see that with the election results of 1920. We see uh, the Democrats um, send James Cox to run as president. His vice presidential candidate was uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, they had the conservative Republican Warren G. Harding. Now, he is considered one of our worst presidents of all time. They pretty much, the Republican Party picked him because he looked like a president, and he promised normalcy, which people wanted, so he won by a big margin. This was also a slap in the face to Wilson's League of Nations because it was a sure, clear sign that the United States had no interest in being part of that. So next we're going to be talking about the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, or the New Era. See you later.